Hello, I'm Lou Bloomfield and this is How Things Work. Today's topic, bumper cars. Now, these guys run on an air pocket to keep them from experiencing too much friction, so I'm going to turn them off because they're kind of noisy. That said, in most vehicles, you drive around trying to avoid anything else. You don't want to hit things. Bumper cars is the exception. In bumper cars, it's not really much fun just driving around as though you're on a really slow moving go-kart. The point of bumper cars is to hit other bumper cars. So today, we're going to talk about what happens when things bump into each other. Well, one way to look at those bumping processes is in terms of transferring some conserved quantities of motion. Uh, those include energy, but they include other things we haven't talked about yet. So when you hit something and, and push on it, you can do work on it and convey energy to it or uh, have energy conveyed to you. But that's not the only thing you can pass along. So what are those other conserved quantities and how do they affect bumper cars? The first one I'll talk about, first conserved quantity, is what's known as momentum. It's a familiar word. It's used in common language all the time. But what it means in physics is a conserved quantity of motion. It's the, it's the conserved quantity of going somewhere. That's as opposed to energy, which is not about going somewhere. It's the conserved quantity of doing things. So conserved quantity of doing things is energy. It's just a simple quantity. As, you know, also known as a scalar quantity. It doesn't have any direction to it. Momentum, as we'll see, is a conserved quantity of going somewhere, of moving, and it does have a direction to it. It cares whether you've got momentum to the right or momentum to the left. They're different. So, uh, a little bit about it. Let's, let's watch it in action. I'll use one of these cars, despite its noisiness. And this car can't get moving to the extent that everything's perfect here, which it isn't. It can't really get moving until I give it momentum. It has, when it has no momentum, it's motionless. To get moving, I have to give it momentum, and then when to stop it, I have to take the momentum back out. So what was going on in there? On a bigger scale and a more perfect equipment, you could, you could see this better, but the basic idea, and I'll illustrate this with myself, is that when I'm motionless, I have none of this conserved quantity known as momentum. I'm not moving anywhere, and I can't start moving anywhere until something gives me momentum. That's because momentum, being a conserved quantity, can't be created or destroyed. I cannot create momentum out of nothing. I need to be given the momentum. Well, what's going to give me momentum? I'll push on something. I can push on, I've got a chair here. I will. I will push on the chair, I'll push it to the left, and it will in turn push me to the right, as it has to. That, you know, Newton's third law and all. So when I push this chair, which is barely in your view, to your left, it will push me to the right for a little period of time, we'll come back to that, and suddenly I've got momentum. And okay, yeah, I'm walking, but you know, forget that, and let me walk, you know, I dress off, off screen. That little process, where the chair gave me a shove to the right for a little period of time, conveyed to me this precious conserved quantity of motion, known as momentum, toward the right. And once I had it, I couldn't stop until I got rid of it. And I worked my way across the room, and oh, okay, eventually I gave it to something else. I either gave it to, I, I could have given it to the things off out of screen to the right, but I gave it to the floor secretly with my feet. So momentum is something that you, that, that you can get, have invested in you, and then you carry it with you, and then you drop it off. The fact that you carry momentum with you is, is interesting. It's an interesting notion. You're, you're truly, you have something that's, that's special. That is, you, that it's in our universe, it's a unique quantity that you've got it. You can't make it or destroy it. You have to give it to something else in order to get rid of it. And that's distinct from force. You don't carry forces with you. It's, it's easy and, and familiar and common for people to say, I, I'm just, that, that meteor was packed full of force and it smashed into the desert. No, it wasn't carrying force. 
the force was involved in, in the impact, and as we'll see, in the transfer of momentum. But when the, when the meteor was streaking across the sky, it was carrying with it this conserved quantity known as momentum, and in a particular direction. All right, so bumper cars. Bumper cars, when one is moving, is carrying with it momentum in the direction it's traveling. So the direction it's traveling matters. And, and how did it get that momentum? It was given that momentum by the ground, because that's how bumper cars propel themselves. They, they grip the ground with friction in their little wheels, and they, they manage to get momentum invested in them in the direction they want to go. And then they head forward carrying that momentum with them. When they collide with one another, which is, again, the whole point of bumper cars is, you know, you want to smash into other bumper cars, during those impacts, they transfer momentum from one to the other. And you can see this happening. Again, pardon the noise. Here we go. I'm going to give momentum to one of the bump bumper cars, and it's going to transfer its momentum to the other bumper car. You can see that happening when one bumper car is sitting still and the other bumper car comes up and smacks it. The first bumper car pretty much stops. Um, the details here are, are interesting and complicated, but it, it can certainly be the case that one car was motionless, the other car was moving and, and therefore carrying momentum to your right with it. it it'll come along, bop the second car. The first car will stop, having given away all its momentum to the, to the second car, and the second car will carry it off and into, <laughs> into the gorge below the table here. So, turn the boat on, of course. Oop. You can kind of see them transferring something between them, and that's the momentum, back and forth. So, a little bit about how you, so, so momentum really is a conserved quantity, we, you know, we, whether I've illustrated it adequately or not. It's truly conserved in our universe, and it moves from thing to thing to thing. It doesn't have to move all entirely. You can, you can arrange it so that one bumper car gives part of its momentum to the second bumper car and retains part itself. Uh, it is actually possible for a bumper car to give more momentum in the direction it's heading than it has. It is uh, where one bumper car will actually smack the other, bump, the other bumper car, and the first bumper car, instead of coming to a stop, having given up all of its momentum, say, to the right, the first bumper car will actually end up heading to the left. Well, if you've got momentum to the left, that is the opposite of momentum to the right. You could also describe it as a negative amount of rightward momentum. So leftward momentum is equivalent to a negative amount of rightward momentum, and vice versa. Uh, if you take a vector, this is true of vectors in general, a vector that's one unit long, two units long, three units long, point to the right, two, one unit long, zero units long, negative one unit long, a vector pointing out this way to your left is the same as a rightward vector of negative length. It just works out in the mathematics just fine. So the point back to momentum, it is possible for a bumper car, there are circumstances on, the, on that playing field where a bumper car will hit the bumper car in front of them and give them so much forward momentum to, to that second bumper car that the first bumper car will end up heading backwards, having given away more forward momentum than it had, therefore running a deficit of forward momentum, which is equivalent to backward momentum, and it'll go backward. So you've seen these, if you've played bumper cars or ridden bumper cars, you've seen these effects where things, where, where one bumper car hits the first and it rebounds. Okay, it, gets, it gives away more momentum than it had. A, 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 a strange notion, but a real one. How do you give momentum to something? The way you do that, there is a mechanical means, in fact it's the only means, of transferring momentum. We saw that work is the mechanical means for transferring energy. And it involves a, a simple process for work. Work, you push on something, and it has to, that something has to move a distance in the direction of your push. That's the world of work. For the world of momentum, the transfer is different. It's called an impulse. You do an impulse on something or give something an impulse. 
I have never been comfortable with, with that, the language itself. It's awkward. Unfortunately, Shakespeare was not a physicist to give us elegant, pretty language to talk about how you transfer momentum. So you transfer momentum by doing an impulse on something. Ah, sad but true. Okay, how do you do an impulse? Does it involve forces and distances and stuff? It involves forces, but not distance. It involves forces and time. You push on something for a period of time, and that's how you convey momentum. And the momentum you transfer, assuming you push steadily, is just the product of your force times the time over which you push, the duration of your push. That's, that is the impulse, and that is the amount of momentum you transfer to something. So if I push this bumper car toward you, I'll do a force on it for one second. During that one second of, of pushing, I convey to it my force times one second, I don't know, some some small uh, amount of newton seconds of momentum. Newton second actually is the unit of momentum uh, in the SI system. Now, nothing much happened to that bumper car because I wasn't the only thing pushing on it. Friction was pushing on it as well and also mucking around with its momentum. But if I, if I turn this guy on and now I'm going to push to your, to your right for one second. One, okay, during that one second, I poured momentum into it toward the right. And to stop it, I have to push it backwards the other way. So I'll put momentum in, I'll take momentum out. Force times time, force times time. That's how you put momentum in, take it out, change it, add some, and so on. To transfer momentum, just in general, you can transfer the same amount of momentum different ways, as long as the force times the time come out to the same uh, product. Uh, overall, you've conveyed the same momentum. So you can push something gently for a long time, or you can push it like crazy, super hard for a short time. If the product of the force times the time is the same, it's the same momentum transfer. That doesn't mean that it's as comfortable one as the other when you're in a bumper car that's undergoing a change in momentum. If, the, if a bumper car were pushed on gently for a long period of time, it would gracefully change its momentum. Momentum would come into it that it didn't have before. And you, as the rider, would notice, whoa, I'm changing my motion here. I'm, I'm being given momentum. That's fine. On the other hand, if something conveyed that same momentum to your car in the thousandth of a second by way of a huge force, this would be uncomfortable. And that's why bumper cars have bumpers. After all, they're not called like hard steel shell cars. They're bumper cars. They got rubber bumpers on them or, or these structures on them that make sure the forces aren't too big. Long time, modest forces, comfortable ride. In contrast, if, it, if you had hard shell bumper cars and uh, the forces would be huge, the times would be short, and everybody would have a not very fun time bouncing around in this game. Okay, so that's bumper cars conveying momentum to one another. Um, a, a few thoughts about the process of conveying momentum between bumper cars. At the same time one car is conveying momentum to another car, the second car is taking out the same amount of momentum from the first car. The transfer is complete. So just to illustrate this, if this car was sitting still with no momentum, and this car, before the story starts, was heading to the right with one unit of momentum, just to, just to make it simple. So along it comes, it conveys all of its momentum to the second car. The second car will now have one unit of momentum carrying with it. The first car, of course, has nothing left. How did that happen? Well, the transfer of, of momentum by way of an impulse, there, there really are two impulses going on, just as there are two forces in Newton's third law. When car A hits car B and gives car B some momentum, car B is also hitting car A and giving car A some momentum. And the momentum that is given back to the, to the A car is equal in amount but opposite in direction to the momentum given by the A car to the B car. I mean, it just comes right out of Newton's third law. They push equally hard on each other in opposite directions for the same amount of time. So they give each other opposite amounts of momentum. And that means there's no momentum created or destroyed. It's just redistributed 
from one to the other. Uh, at the same time momentum is transferred, energy is often transferred as well. Uh, a, a rare exception to that would be two cars bouncing off each other like this, symmetrically. Those two cars uniquely did not do any work on each other. As they came in, they pushed, they dented, they pushed back. That surface in between never moved. So although they exerted forces on one another, they did no work on each other. And they just bounced back off, having conveyed no energy from one to the other. They, they, they leave having the same energy they started, but they have transferred momentum because they started off heading toward each other, they ended heading away from each other. Wow, they've, they've had a quite, a, quite a substantial change in momentum, each one. Overall, as a pair, they have the same momentum they started with because as a pair, they haven't exchanged momentum with the rest of the world. In most cases, though, so that, that's the weird case where they don't uh, do any work on each other. No energy was transferred, only momentum. In most bumper car collisions, they, the two cars simultaneously transfer momentum and energy. In exactly how much of each one goes from, from one to the other, it's complicated. It, it, of course, both quantities are conserved. Momentum has to be conserved. Energy has to be conserved. Some of the energy can be turned into thermal energy. That's a possibility. But basically, overall, you can't make or destroy either energy or momentum. And that very tightly constrains the bounces. You never get weird things where, where one car comes in at you know, two, two identical cars. One comes in at a certain speed, the other one goes off twice as fast. It can't happen. That would violate conservation of energy and of momentum. Disaster. You can't have one come along and hit the other one and come to a dead stop. Similarly, similarly, momentum disappeared. It, there was some to the right, now there's none. Can't happen. Uh, energy disappeared from our view. It's possible, however, that it became thermal energy. So it could still be here in the thermal motion of the particles. So energy conservation doesn't outlaw this. But momentum conservation definitely does. So highly constrained how things bounce off each other. And the rules are complicated, and I won't put them all in here. Um, I will, I guess I will tell you that, that when a gigantic, how can I make it gigantic? A car filled with people, okay, <laughs> you know, with enormous mass, comes and hits a much, a car with almost nobody in it, or a tiny, a child, a little, little kid in there. When this car comes along and hits the stationary car with a child in it, the first car does not stop entirely. It cannot, if it tried to give all of its momentum, you know, therefore to stop, to give all its momentum to the second car, the second car would have to move very fast to carry that much momentum. And it would end up with more energy than was present in the system to start with. So instead, the first car comes along and swats the second car while the first car keeps going. Uh, it slows down, the first car slows down some. Uh, it, it has given some of its momentum to the second small car, but it can't give all of it without, without uh, messing up, messing with the, the law of conservation of energy. Um, the opposite is also interesting. If, the fir if, if a, a, a massive car is sitting there motionless and a little kid drives up and smacks into the car, the little kid also, even if the little kid gives, it, gives this all of its uh, momentum. The second car carries away that momentum moving so slowly that it doesn't, that it's, that there's, there's energy missing from the story. So what happens instead is the first car bounces off the second car and the second car heads off. Uh, this, the first car has given the, the second car more momentum than the first car had and is therefore heading backwards now. Uh, it's carrying some of the original energy and it's got less, it's got a negative amount of momentum compared to what it started with. Now to understand some of what I just said, having done this not in the perfect order, when you have momentum, you're carrying it with you. You're carrying it, you know, how, how, how as you watch something go by, how would you know how much momentum it is carrying? I mean, you, you can ask it and you can hope they can tell you, but there's a way of calculating it. It happens to be 
the object's mass times the object's velocity, including the direction aspect of the velocity. So momentum and velocity are in the same direction. So this, this the little kid here heading to the right, the little kid has, has small mass to carry one unit of momentum to the right. The small kid has to travel fast, big velocity. You got little mass times big velocity gives you one unit of rightward momentum. The car that's, that's massive, full of big people, okay, it's heading also to the right, carrying one unit of momentum. How does that happen? Well, because they've got so much mass, they carry the momentum easily, even when they're traveling at small, small velocity. So these two cars, I'll make, try to make these two cars, carry the same momentums to the right. There they go. Okay? The low mass car has to go faster to the right. The high mass car has to go slower. All right. So bumper cars. You watch the bumper cars drive around the, the, the arena, the rink. They hit each other. They're transferring momentum by way of force, impulse, force times time. Uh, they're transferring energy by way of force times distance. They bounce off each other. The forces are generally kept small so that people aren't, don't find this too violent and, and upsetting. And that's most of, the, mo of the, the, the translational motion. That leaves a second conserved quantity to pay attention to that's new. So, so, so far we know about energy, a conserved quantity that has no direction, just an amount. We know about momentum, a conserved quantity that has a direction. It's the conserved quantity of going somewhere, of moving. And again, I'll remind you, the, the, conserved, the energy is the conserved quantity of doing things. Momentum is the conserved quantity of going somewhere. There's a third conserved quantity to pay attention to. It's called angular momentum, and it is the conserved quantity of rotating, of turning, and spinning, all that stuff. And you carry that with you as well. So just as you do not carry a force with you, you instead you carry momentum with you. You don't carry torque with you or a twist with you. You carry a conserved quantity of rotation known as angular velocity. When, when we get you spinning, you can't stop spinning until you get rid of the angular momentum you're carrying. All right, so can we show you angular momentum in, 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 uh, in practice? Somewhat. I'll get this guy friction free. Right now, it can't start spinning on its own to the extent that this is semi-perfect. It can't start spinning on its own. To get it spinning, I have to give it angular momentum because it can't create any on its own. So I'm going to give it angular momentum. Ready? It gets that twist, okay? Once I get it going, it can't stop spinning until I take the angular momentum back out. I put it in, I take it back out. Put it in, take it back out. Put it in, take it back. Put it in the other way, take it back out, and so on. So angular momentum, it has an amount, it has a direction. The direction follows the same rules as all the rotational quantities. This, if this will be angular momentum upward. Ready? There. Upward angular momentum. It's spinning like this. My thumb is pointing upward. That's upward angular momentum. This is downward angular momentum. And uh, you can put them in, take them out. You put them in and take them out by way of an angular impulse. And an angular impulse is a torque times time. So when I twist it, the, the, the strength of my torque in the direction my torque matter, and the time, how, how long I twist it for. And you can put the same angular momentum in by way of a gentle, gentle torque for a long time, or a violent torque for a short time. As long as the product of the two, for, torque times time, is the same, it's the same. So in bumper cars, part of the fun too there is, is the twists that occur when the cars hit each other. They experience friction. They've got, they've got uh, rough, uh, grippy bumpers, traction. And when they grip each other, they, they, they convey angular momentum between the two bumper cars. And when that happens, uh, you suddenly start, start spinning or stop spinning or spin differently. And again, those bumpers are designed so that the torques involved are significant but not outrageous so that you don't find yourself with your, your, your head left behind facing the wrong way, uh, something out of a bad horror movie. Um, so those were anger, 
uh, angular impulses convey angular momentum. Uh, angular momentum, uh, you, can, you can look at an object and you can figure out what its angular momentum is. Its angular momentum is the product, you know, just, just as with, with ordinary momentum, remember, the ordinary momentum is the product of the object's mass times its velocity. Angular momentum, an object's angular momentum, is the product of its angular velocity times its rotational mass. So, a, a, a car that's filled with people and it has a lot of mass and they, they're hanging out on the, on the periphery of the car so they contribute a lot to rotational mass. So a car that has a lot of rotational mass can carry angular momentum easily, even when it's not turning very rapidly, has a, and therefore has a small angular velocity. The car with the little kid in it, on the other hand, uh, because it has relatively little mass, the kid's sitting in the center of the natural pivot so that, the, so that the kid doesn't contribute much to the rotational mass, it's got a small rotational mass. In order to carry one unit of angular momentum, for example, it has to turn much faster in the same direction as the, as the, 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 big, the big guy um, bumper car. So angular momentum is different. Now, that brings up an interesting observation about, about angular momentum, is that when you're in isolation, you're just moving along through empty space, having been given momentum, say, first. When you've got momentum, you're a spacecraft heading off to the stars, far from anything that would ever push on you. You can't stop moving. You are carrying the momentum with you. You can't change your mass, so you can't change your velocity. Unless something pushes on you to transfer momentum to you by way of an impulse, your velocity is just stuck. Uh, this is the origin of Newton's first law of motion for translational motion. Uh, the fact that momentum is a conserved quantity in our universe means that objects that are free of external forces can't change their momentum. And since they can't change their momentum or their mass, they can't change their velocity. They move at constant velocity. Okay, so that's the momentum world. How about anger, the angular rotational world? Uh, when you are an isolated object out in deep space and something got you spinning, you're carrying angular, moment, angular momentum and you can't change it. Not without something doing an angular impulse on you by exerting a torque on you. But there are no torques. Ah, oh, you're stuck. Your angular momentum is completely stuck. That, however, doesn't mean your angular velocity is, is stuck, is fixed. Why not? Because you, being a non-rigid object, can change your shape. And if you do, you change your rotational mass. So by pulling into a tuck, for example, so you shrink your rotational mass, your angular momentum cannot change. But because your rotational mass goes down, your angular velocity has to go up to compensate. Because the two of them, rotational mass and angular velocity, multiplied together is your, is your angular velocity, angular momentum. So you can keep angular momentum constant while changing those two. If you, if you spread out into a, into a long, thin thing, your, anger, your rotational mass goes up. So your angular velocity has to go down to compensate. So this, this the conservation of, of angular momentum gives rise to the Newton's first law for rotational motion. But remember that law has the, has the requirement that it only applies to rigid objects. Objects that cannot change their rotational mass. So ones that can, like people, are not covered by Newton's first law of rotational motion. Wobbling is, 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 is related to an object that can wobble has more than one active rotational mass. And so it's also not covered by Newton's first law of rotational motion. You got to be just the simple objects, a, a spinning ball, fine. It's, it, it's, uh, it spins at constant angular velocity because it cannot change its rotational mass. All right, that's the story that, uh, of the two conserved quantities that really underlie, uh, along with energy, the third conserved quantity, that underlie the motion of, of bumper cars. That just the, the rink is a big study in the transfer of these conserved quantities between objects. That leaves still one other observation that's worth putting into this, this story, bumper cars. And that is, 
If the, the bumper car arena is not perfectly flat, then it is possible for a bumper car to sort of roll in and out of hills and valleys. And when that happens, I mean, we could think of that in terms of ramps, that suddenly the bumper car is on a ramp, or we could think of it in terms of the bumper car's store of potential energy, in particular gravitational potential energy. The higher the bumper car is on this undulating uh, uh, surface floor, the more gravitational potential energy it has. And the lower it is in some valley, the less gravitational potential energy it has. So its gravitational potential energy can rise and fall depending on where it is as it drives around a, an imperfect arena. How does that affect the motion? And we could think of it in terms of ramps and that would be fine, but we also can look at the fact that potential energies in general and gravitational potential energy in particular is energy stored in forces. For gravitational potential energy, it's stored in the forces of gravity between two objects. And so there are forces and potential energies are, are best buddies. They are totally connected to one another. And we know that forces cause acceleration. So if you know which way the net force on an object is, you know which way it's going to accelerate and actually how much. This also assumes you know the mass of the object. It turns out that if you know the object's potential energy as, as, it, as it depends on, on its location, on its position actually, you can also figure out which way the object is going to accelerate. And there's a rule in describing this, and I'll try to justify the rule after I say it. The rule is that an object always accelerates in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible. So that means that if you have an object like this, and you put it at various places in a, in a, in a situation, and you measure its potential energy, its total potential energy, all the potential energies you can ever think of, gravitational, elastic, um, electromagnetic, nuclear, all this stuff, you know what the total potential energy is at every location, and you discover that the total potential energy is higher here than here, and this is the fastest way you can move it. The sh over the shortest distance, you get the biggest change going like this. This is nothing. This is the wrong way. This, is, this really reduces the total potential energy quickly. That's, that's the direction in which the object's going to accelerate. Now, as I'm waving this thing around and showing you, I'm thinking the only, the only potential energy that's sort of present and, and worth paying attention to here is gravitational potential energy. I don't have any springs or any electric charges or magnets or whatever. But if they were there, we'd have to pay attention to them. Since they're not here, we can just simplify the story and say the only potential energy worth paying attention to is gravitational. This disk has more gravitational potential energy here than it does here. It also has more, more here, than he, than here, but this isn't the most efficient way to go to drop the total potential energy. This is. It's the steepest, what's called the steepest gradient. Actually, it's opposite the gradient. Gradients. Are, are, are a gradient in a physical quantity is, is a situation where the physical quantity depends on position and it increases, the physical quantity increases, say when you go in this direction. And I could, I could do this in post-production. I could have colors go from blue to red and they go fastest this way. And that would be the, the red gradient. You actually, it points in the direction of maximum increase. So the red is swooping up this way, and off it would go. Another familiar situation in which there is a gradient in the physical quantity in space is fragrance gradients. If you watch a dog, the dog will be sniffing around trying to find the, the, the gradient in the smell of something the dog likes, like some food, right? It'll, and it'll go... It's getting stronger that way. That's the way the dog will go towards the maximum increase, you know, right along the, the sharp gradient itself, towards maximum increase. Okay, so gradients show up in our ordinary world, color gradients, smell gradients, altitude gradients when you're driving over an undulating surface. And associated with altitude gradients are gravitational potential energy gradients. 
And this rule that, that an object accelerates in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible means an object accelerates in the uh, opposite the potential energy gradient. The potential energy gradient, the, the, the direction of maximum increase in gravitational potential energy here for this disk is straight up. That's the, that's the most efficient way you can crank up the gravitational potential energy of this disk. So this object will accelerate the opposite direction to, to reduce the gravitational potential energy as quickly as possible. So that's, this is the gradient direction. This is opposite the gradient. And this is, va this is a valuable observation in general. I'll say it again so that it's clear what's valuable. Objects in general accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energies as quickly as possible. If the only potential energy is gravity, that's usually pretty easy to figure out anyway. You don't really need that rule uh, to, to figure out which way things will go when you let go of them. They fall downward because that, you know, that's the direction of the force on them, the net force on them. But there are situations where it's very, very hard to figure out what the net force on something is. Or even uh, the torques may be involved. It's a big mess. So how do you figure out which way it's going to accelerate? For example, this. If I let this guy fall over, it's no longer quite so clear which way it's going to accelerate. Uh, what I can tell you, though, is you know, based on forces, uh, they're messy. But what I can tell you is it, it accelerates so as to reduce its total potential energy as quickly as it possibly could. And so we'll, we'll find this useful in dealing with more complicated situations where there are a number of forces around and we don't really want to try to calculate all of them. Instead, we figure out what the potential energy is and, and, and watch the thing head accelerate in the direction of that maximum uh, decrease, the fastest decrease. All right, with that then, I will leave the world of bumper cars.